Bear with us. wait for the internet to connect so Just read me his thing. It's really wholesome, even if I'm not like very religious myself. It's just really nice for someone to like uh, offer their time and like their thinking space. It makes me feel seen. It makes me feel like wanted and blessed. It's always a nice thing, know. even if it's not for for a cause or yeah. a reason. When I lived in France, I went blind. <laughs> this is so, this is so <laughs> weird. But I went, I went completely blind and I remember my, my family were like texting me like, we're praying for you, like all the time. Exactly. And I wasn't, and now I'm not blind anymore. So I guess maybe it works. Yeah.
over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. You mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, At his birth, Jesus was given two names, and I've always thought we need both of them. First, Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This is the life-giving, perspective-changing, setting-off point for the Christian faith. God is not quite as we expected. God is not separate. God is the down-to-earth, here and now, walking with us and sharing what it is to be human, the in-your-face God. This is still scandalous for some people who like God on a pedestal. But for Christians, it's a beginning. And in my own prayer and Christian life, it's where I always begin. The knowledge that God is with me, that God is on my side, that God believes in me. But he is also called Jesus, which means God saves. But from what, you might ask, and how? Well, God saves us from ourselves, from that tendency to put self first, and from all the other horrors that proceed from such a separation. So God is always the one who directs me away from myself, away from introspection, away from self-seeking. God directs my prayers towards the world and all its needs and towards others. Which is what Thy Kingdom Come is all about. There's a clue in the title. It is God's kingdom we seek, not our own. And it is God's people we pray for, especially those we know and love, but also the needs of others right across the world. However, I also believe that before people can discover God as the one who saves, they need to experience God as Emmanuel, the one who's with us. And that's also our responsibility, to demonstrate the presence of Jesus by our care and witness, sharing a vision of what life can be like when God's kingdom comes and we are drawn into the community of God's grace and peace.
The reading is taken from Revelation chapter 22, verses 12 to 14, 16 to 17, and 20 to 21. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Thus with those who wash their robes, that they may have the right tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony to the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who may say, Come, let the one who is blessed come, and let the one who wishes to taste the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things say, Ah, yes, I am going soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Gospel reading is taken from John, chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I am them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in there. Amen. Thank you, Abigail, and thank you for those readings. And um, now I'd ask Kate, if you mind coming up and just saying a few words on um, how she knows the boss. I'm happy to introduce Andy Cross to you. I know him through his wife, Joan. Joan did her first degree at Liverpool University and lived in the Hall of Residence where I was a manager. She was one of my favourite students and referred to me as her Liverpool mom. Towards the end of her degree, Jo applied for a job that was exactly what she wanted. This job was working for Share Jesus International. There she met Andy, and as they say, the rest is history. Share Jesus International was founded in 2000 by the late Reverend Dr. Rob Cross, the Methodist minister for the New Church. <coughs> uh, Andy became director of SJI in 2008, following the death of his father. Their signature event for 20 years was Easter People, which has now been replaced by Pentecost Festival. Over the past few years, there have been an array of missional projects, which include 
short term missions, youth leadership development courses, national tours, one of which did include a visit to PhD, a campaign challenging the mainstream of the culture, and a series of short films. Andy was in Liverpool on Thursday meeting with a group of social action charities looking at how to connect social action and faith sharing. At the heart of everything Andy does is that he wants to help people follow Jesus. This is just a snapshot of all that and a, a, a snapshot of what Andy and SJR do. He really does a lot more. But the important person today to share the message is Andy Frost. He would have loved to have been here in person. He couldn't fit it into his schedule. I hope you find what he has to say thought provoking and interesting. Thank you. Hi there, good morning, Elm Hall Drive. My name is Andy Frost, I'm the director of Share Jesus. We do a whole range of different projects looking at how we share and communicate the Christian faith, working through different local churches. Thank you, Kate, so much for inviting me to come and share this morning. It is great to be with you, even though it is via video. I want to share this morning from Genesis chapter 11, the story of the Tower of Babel. Which is particularly poignant as we look towards Pentecost that is just around the corner. But I want to open up by thinking about scripture, the Bible, these many books that form the Bible we have today. Where a story begins and where a story ends is really important. And the story that we have in scripture begins with creation. It begins with God creating everything. There's a stunning picture in Genesis chapter 1 of the sun and the moons marking the seasons, vegetation bearing seeds, the birds and the fish being told to increase, for humanity to be fruitful and increase in number. Creation is not static or stagnant or fixed, but alive, active, laden with potential. And the idea is that this garden where things begin, it progresses and it ends in a city. John writes in Revelation 21 verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. The story begins in the garden and it ends in a city. And then Genesis 11, one of my favourite stories is about the Tower of Babel, which might seem a bit random, but I think it's really helpful for us today to explore something, what it means for us to follow Jesus in this present moment. It begins, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. First of all, how good would that be? Whenever you go abroad and you have to try and slow down and try and put on an accent to try and communicate. These people all spoke the same language. Verse two, as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now, this was like a flat valley between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, modern day Iraq. And this nomadic people finally find a place to settle. Verse three, they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Now, if you're wondering, this is kind of an old school version of the great British Bake Off as they baked these different bricks. It wasn't quite. This was a new invention, the brick. Verse four. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now the story begins in the garden 
and it ends in the city. This is the, the flow of scripture. And yet there is something wrong about this city. That phrase, come, let us build ourselves. Come, let us. The author is making a little point here. In Genesis chapter 1, we have God saying, come, let us make man kind in our image. The people were almost trying to take the role of God. And you might think, well, hang on a sec, we would never do that. That would never be us doing that. And yet there are three things in verse 4 that I think are a challenge to me and us as individuals, but also a challenge to us as a church, as God's people. The first thing is this. They were trying to make a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Now, building with stones is hard because stones are different shapes, and yet suddenly a brick had been invented. They could stack these bricks on top of each other, and they could build something which would actually reach much higher than they ever had done previously. Now, I love building towers. When my kids were very little, often they had those little bricks to play with, and we'd try and build towers in our lounge, but every two minutes they'd knock down my tower because they enjoyed knocking them down rather than building them. So eventually, when they went to bed, I'd get out the bricks and quickly build myself a nice, big, tall tower. There's nothing wrong with building towers, but there is something wrong with this tower. It's the insistence that it will reach to the heavens. Now, you might be thinking, were people really that simple? Do they really think they could build a tower that reached all the way up to the heavens? I mean, it wasn't quite funny if they had got to the edge of the stratosphere and began to find it hard breathing. I don't think they really thought they'd bring it to the heavens, but because if you were going to do that, you would not build it on a plane, but you start on a mountain, give you a good little head start. But the tower symbolised something. It symbolised their desire to be independent from God. They didn't think they needed God. Perhaps they thought that they could even take his place. What they were building had become perhaps more important than God himself. Society needs a vision. I guess we're always looking for the future and what it can look like. And perhaps in our society today we're often thinking about technological advances in, in medicine and in phones and all kinds of things that deliver us a better future. And sometimes it can leave us as a society marginalising God. But it can also be a challenge for us as individuals as well. We can rely upon our own skills, on our own ingenuity, on the latest tech, rather than keeping God central. I actually got a friend called John and he um, was organising a big surf comp at some outreach a few years ago. And he pulled together a whole bunch of things for his big competition on the beach. He pulled together staging and marquees and the whole thing. About a week before the actual competition, the forecast was for no waves. So he, he, he prayed and he planned and he prayed and he planned. It came to the morning of the competition and there were still no waves. He had to cancel the entire thing. And he got really angry with God, like, God, why would you let this happen? And my friend John really felt that God said to him this, this comp has become more about you than it has become about me. See, John has, was doing a good thing, but it becomes such his focus that actually he'd marginalised God from the process. We need to keep God central in the things that we are building. The second thing in verse 4 is this, is so that we may make a name for ourselves. The people were building this city with this great big tower to make a name for themselves. Now, there's nothing wrong about making a name for yourself. As, as a church or as an individual, you could be a good teacher, a good parent, a good business person, a good administrator, a good grandparent. But here's the challenge. When we become more focused on our name than we are on God's name, that's when we have a problem. We become so bothered about our reputation that we fail to give God glory. One of the key guys making a name for himself in this story was Nimrod. And in chapter 10, you see that Babel was 
one of the first centres of his kingdom. It's the first time in scripture that the word kingdom is mentioned. And here's the thing about kingdoms. Kingdoms need a king. And throughout scripture there's a kind of common theme that God wants to be our king. But in chapter 10 verse 9 we see that Nimrod was a mighty warrior. He can also be translated violent oppressor. By building his name, it seems that he was oppressing others. When we become so focused on making a name for ourselves, we can often slight others and push others down. A real challenge for me and perhaps for you is, how do we talk about other people? How do we talk about other churches? How do we talk about what other people are doing? If you're a fan of The Apprentice, you'll see time and time again how people often push others down to make themselves look better, making a name for ourselves. Are we more bothered about our name or God's name? The third thing in verse 4 is this. Otherwise we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. These people did not want to be scattered and yet in chapter 9 verse 1 after the flood they had been commissioned again to go and fill the whole earth and yet they'd found this nice fertile land and thought they'd stop here rather than going further i guess for them cities were actually quite safe places there were other humans there you could build a wall to protect yourselves you could have farm land to look after and to harvest and if you move on, then suddenly you have no backup. You're all alone. There are wild animals. If you're a group just travelling the world as nomads, you have to rely upon God. Perhaps this illustration is the idea that they were more focused on their comfort than they were on obedience to God. The Christian life is not always comfortable. Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. Where might we have chosen being comfortable over being obedient? I was doing a mission down in Cornwall a few years ago. I remember one day in this little kind of cafe we were running, this really big, scary, homeless guy walked in. He had long, kind of dark hair and he kind of, he didn't smell very good. And he kind of waved and like, I want to speak to somebody. This really brave 14 year old stepped forward and said, Sure, you can talk to Andy. I was like, No, I don't want to talk to you at all. And my, my initial thing was, How quickly can I get out of this conversation with this man? And yet, as I began to hear his story, God began to break my heart for him. I was so bothered, perhaps, by my own comfort that I wasn't being obedient in seeing what I could do for this man and showing him more of who Christ is through my words and my actions. Let's keep being obedient to the things that God has called us to do. Let's not look for the always having the comfortable option. And in this story, in verse five, we see what God does as they begin to build this city with this tower, making a name for themselves so they won't be scattered. Verse five says this, but the Lord came down to the city and the tower the people were building. Now this is kind of Hebrew sarcasm, a bit of comedy. It's like, oh wow, how big your tower is that God had to come down to have a quick look at it. Verse six, the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Nothing they do will be impossible. You almost get a sense, well, is God scared? I don't think God is scared. But I think God has seen how quickly from the flood they had continued to neglect him and how quickly they have become more and more evil. And God's not scared for himself, but he's scared for the people. He has concern for his people. He has concern for his creation. He wants to protect them. And so in verse 7, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Verse 8. So the Lord scattered them from there 
over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. That Hebrew word Babel means mixed up or confused. He confuses them to turn them back to himself. There's no flood. There's no lightning bolts. This is actually a moment of God's grace for his people. That is ultimately expressed later on in the story as Jesus enters human history and goes to the cross. There were three things wrong with the city. The first thing is that God was lost from their vision. The second thing, they were making a name for themselves. And the third thing, they had chosen comfort over obedience. These are healthy challenges for us today, corporately as a church, but also as individuals. There's one more great reminder in this story. At Babel, this is the place where they had tried to build something up to the heavens and God had confused their language. And yet as we get towards Pentecost in Acts 2, we see that God makes it clear that it's never about building things up to the heavens. It's always about God coming down and meeting his people. He's done it throughout scripture, ultimately in Jesus. And then on the day of Pentecost, he pours out his spirit upon all his people. And they supernaturally begin to speak other languages. We see almost Babel being reversed. My challenge to you this morning is this. Will you look to perceive a fresh sense of God's spirit in your life? Will you look not just to build a vision without God, but to have God as your vision? Will you look to have a name for God being made in your life, first and foremost, rather than making a name just for yourself? And will you be obedient in those challenging things that God calls you to do, even if they aren't always comfortable? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this ancient story from scripture that speaks into our context today. As we look towards Pentecost, we thank you that you long to dwell in our lives, to work in and through us as your people. Help us have you at the core of our vision. Help us to make a name for you rather than just ourselves. Help us to be obedient to the things you have in store for us to do, rather than just looking for the comfortable options. Father, we're sorry when we do things our own way. Help us to do things your way. May we decrease and may you increase in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, just to say that thank you to Kate for um, uh, explaining to me how much she knows I'm going to ask this. That's really interesting. I didn't know anything about Kate. Uh, we're now going to sing again, uh, Oh Lord, my God.
Christ can take it. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to
power and the glory are yours. Now, Amen.